my pleasure to moderate this panel. Uh, 30 years ago, I was a graduate student with the great good fortune to um, attend. And um, I, over the years, I've just benefited so much learning from um, the founding members, from the, uh, the gatherings of scholars and advocates um, that this conference has just uh, done an amazing job of bringing together at locations around the world, as you can see from the slide show here. Uh, so this is welcome to this panel. This is the ISCO Founders Roundtable. And um, despite circumstances, despite the pandemic, despite sort of the fraught geopolitical situation of our world, um, we have four founders who are here who are going to share with you histories and experiences and insights. Um, this session is part of the 30th anniversary conference um, of the International Society for the Study of Chinese Overseas. The conference is sponsored by the Asian American Research Center and the Asian American and Asian Diaspora Studies Program at UC Berkeley. And I'll just throw in a tremendous um, thank you to Lok Su and to Ling Chi Wong and Jessica Joe and all of their team for organizing this amazing uh, event. Uh, also, Jinan University in Guangdong and the Asia Pacific Center at UC Los Angeles. It is also co-sponsored by the Institute of East Asian Studies and the Center for Chinese Studies at UC Berkeley. So before we get started, please silence your cell phones or other devices that may interrupt us. The format of this panel is that each of our panelists will speak for about eight minutes, uh, and then we will have discussion after all the presentations. Uh, welcome to those of you who are joining, joining us via Zoom. Please use the Q&A feature to ask your questions, and we will incorporate these into the discussion as well. Um, now, I'm delighted to uh, introduce uh, first Wei Li, who is a fellow board member, and Wei has um, prepared a slideshow uh, which commemorates um, many of the past gatherings. Um, Wei, Wei Li is professor of the Asian Pacific American Studies School of Social Transformation and School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning at Arizona State University. Uh, she, her research focuses on migration and integration and transnational connections, focusing on the Indo-Pacific region. She's the author, um, co-editor or co-translator of seven scholarly books, three journal theme issues, and has 156 other academic publications. Wow. She is the National Counselor of the American Association of Geographers and is the North American Director for the for ISCO and is currently the Carroll Visiting Professor at University of Chicago. And Wei is going to just come up and uh, offer us some comments. Thank you, Madeline. Uh, I want to echo Madeline said, what a great conference it has been. We all know 30 years ago, ISCO formed here, right here in San Francisco. So now ISCO from the brain child, brain baby of some of our founding mothers and, and fathers to a adult. So in Chinese, we say San Shi er Li. So that's exactly the 30 years. In the past two days, collectively, we all had great panel, great symposium. So we realized what kind of collective challenge we all face and what are the uncertain future we all face, how we should fight, especially this morning's panel, how should we fight for racial justice for everyone, ourselves and our families, our fellow Chinese Americans, as well as all the people in this particular country and beyond. So now let's step back, look at the history, what collective footstep we have been uh, we have been doing together as the slide shows uh, we compiled. ISCO, uh, Professor Li Minghuan asked us to do, so uh, Tessie and, and Karen Minjo all contributed to those photos. So we want to show how we are collectively going through this 30 years process. Uh, on, we all know only by looking at the past, we can know our today better. As the Chinese say, Wen Gu er zhi xin. So without further ado, given the show already running for a few rounds, and thanks for Berkeley, Je uh, Jessica, and uh, others to make the 
to make this auto show so we don't have to say too much or, or manually handle it. Without further ado, I turn back to Matlin to monitor the founders panel. Thank you. Um, so um, first, I would like to introduce uh, Teresita Angsi, who has been long-term uh, treasurer uh, for the organization, and and you know, and uh, Teresita Angsi has really been, in many ways, the glue that's held this organization together for, um, I think it's about a quarter century now, really. Um, uh, so she is a well-known social activist who has championed the cause of ethnic Chinese majority in the Philippine society. She served as past president of ISCO, the Philippine Association for Chinese Studies, and Caixa Sara Sa Quan Loran, and also serves as executive trustee of the Caixa Heritage Center, which houses Baha'i Tsinoi, the Museum of the Chinese and Philippine Life. She has authored, co authored, and co edited 21 books, among them the five volume, The Chinese in the Philippines Problems and Perspectives, uh, and Chinoi, the Story of the Chinese and Philippine Life. So, Professor. I'm proud to be uh, one of the founders of uh, ISCO as uh, the first vice president to uh, Wang Lingzi, uh, to Wang, Professor Wang Gengwu in the board with me was, of course, uh, Professor Wang Lingzi. Um, but few people know that my being an academic uh, is accidental. As Madeline said, uh, I'm more of a social activist, and I was invited to the first ISCO conference, not in my role as an academic, but in my role as a political activist. I was one of the two plenary speakers at that time, much the same as the first plenary that we had here with Lucretia Mack, the daughter of Myrna Mack, the Chinese Guatemalan, who was killed because she protected her people in Guatemala. And I was invited uh, in the first ISCO conference in my role in helping victims of crime, uh, mainly kidnapping. But I said my being academic was accidental uh, and three people were responsible for it. All of them happened to be the founders of ISCO. They may not even be aware of their role in my journey to being an academic. There are professors Wang Gengwu, Professor Wang Linzi, and Professor Leo Surya Dinata. Okay, did you find it? Okay, it started 1985, the first, one of the very first Chinese overseas conference in Canberra, uh, ANU, Australian National University, convened by Professor Wang Gengwu with uh, the late Jennifer Kusman. Okay, that's June 1985. It was followed very so, uh, quite soon by Professor Leo Suryananato's panel on research and scholarship on the Chinese in the ASEAN states. In both those conferences in 1985 and the IAHA conference panel, I was not the speaker. It was my late husband who was the speaker, uh, Professor Chin Ben Si. Unfortunately, he died uh, a month after Leo's panel uh, was convened. And following him three months after, Professor Antonio Tan, the other speaker in the ANU first conference on Chinese overseas, also passed on. Those of you who know the Chinese Filipino community, it is a predominantly merchant community. They frown upon academics and academic pursuits. Uh, where I was like, okay, Dr. Antonio Tan also passed away and it left a vacuum when Professor Wang Gungwu and Leo Surya Dinata contacted me and wanted me to, uh, needed help to revise the paper. Me being the slave labor who edited, revised, footnoted my late husband's paper was of course uh, the, the only candidate. Um, so I helped them, Jenny, uh, the late Jennifer Kusman and Professor Wang Gungwood edit my paper and Dr. Antonio Tan's paper. I must have impressed them because the next conference, 1988 in Xiamen, where the plans for ISCO was hatched, I was invited as, speak, as the speaker and that was my first international conference at Xiamen. 
and we had the plans to put up an ISCO. Later on, uh, Professor Wang Linzi will tell you the stories behind that. In 1992, of course, we succeeded um, the the first uh, conference was convened by the third person who influenced me was, of course, Dr. Wang Linzi, because he asked me to be one of the plenary speakers in my role as political activist, not as an academic at that time. So I talk about the political participation of the Chinese Filipinos, and I wanted to respond to the first panel a while ago that we succeeded in calling for a boycott of the one day shutdown of all Chinese Filipino owned businesses in Binondo, the Chinatown, and the shutdown of all Chinese Filipino schools for one day during the funeral of a 15 year old girl who was killed due to kidnapping. That was our affirmative action, which Bang Linzi, of course, pioneered here. And he knew the, uh, what, I was, what I had been doing in Manila. So, after that 1992 conference, the rest is history. We founded ISCO, and they uh, asked me to be one of the to be the vice president to Wang Gengwu. And um, we subsequently convened two conferences of ISCO. First is in 1998, the third one, the third international conference. And then uh, followed in uh, 2012, another conference on Chinese language. The first 1998 uh, conference was more was uh, specifically on cultural integration, cross cultural, intercultural relations, identity transformation. So it was a very interesting uh, conference because uh, um, the it's the first time that we explored what is the identity, how do you call yourself? And Professor Wang Gengwu gave a very good keynote speech on. Who do you call, how do you consider yourself and, and things like that. So after that, following us were more scholars encouraged to do research on the Chinese in the Philippines. Uh, joining us this, this morning was Professor Dr. Richard Chu. We have Dr. Caroline Howe, doc, uh, Dr. Um, uh, uh, anyway, the more young scholars came in and uh, among them, of course, was is my daughter who was presented in the three recent ISCO conferences. So I said, this is my last one. In the future, she will be the one who will be presenting in any of the ISCO conferences. I'd like to think that this is one of the influences that we were able to do. Uh, we, we even try to convince the parents of, this, of the young scholars that it's OK to let them pursue academic career and don't force them to, to go into business. There are many, many people who can do business, but few people would like to teach. So uh, that is one of our successes. And there were many, many other conferences that followed after that. We had many, many trajectories in our research. It widened the scope and uh, the length and the breadth of the research on the Chinese in the Philippines that you could not even imagine. For example, in 2013, uh, Claudine Salmon uh, flew here from Fra flew to Manila from France when we convened a workshop on uh, uh, topics such as uh, Chinese cemeteries in Southeast Asia, uh, stories and tales that tombstones tell. So it's, it's an, one of the interesting topics. Then we have research on new Chinese immigrants, the Sin Yimin, and uh, of course, COVID-19, 2020 lockdown, we have almost one uh, seminar or uh, almost every month or every other month in va with various topics on racism and discrimination, infodemic, xenophobia, and uh, political and mainly political participation. So to today, in uh, yesterday in our panel, I said 30 years after my first talk on the political participation of the Chinese Filipinos, we have uh, made significant strides in uh, strengthening the position of the Chinese Filipinos in claiming their identity as Filipinos, albeit of Chinese descent. So our 
uh, credo in Kaisa, my main organization is our blood may be Chinese, but our roots grow deep in Philippine soil. Our bonds are with the Filipino people. So I proceeded with many, many other conferences and books and publications uh, that Madeline already talked about. And so thank you very much. That's all that I can share that uh, in all of this work, INSCO has uh, played an important role in encouraging me to be pursuing this path, uh, which I never imagined I would be doing. Um, but having been chosen as the president of our my own organization and then vice president of ISCO and later on its secretary, so I have it forced me to do this kind of to expand my research and continue this kind of work and journey. Thank you very much. Um, next, I want to introduce uh, Professor Karen Harris, who is a full professor at the University of Pretoria, where she is both the head of the Department of History of sorry of Historical and Heritage Studies and director of the University archives. She did her PhD on the history of overseas Chinese in South Africa, while her master's included the indentured Chinese labor scheme on the gold mines. Her re research focuses on the earliest encounters of China with Africa, the Chinese within the Southern African region throughout the colonial period, apartheid to the new democratic dispensation. Her research was also used in the high court case regarding the BEE court case, um, and Chinese hate speech court case, both of which were won by the South African Chinese community. Thank you. Right, thank you very much, Madeleine, for that introduction, and thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your time. My story begins in Africa, and um, um, with the, my master's degree, which um, included the Chinese as indentured laborers in Southern Africa. It's a topic that's been written about almost to death by people across the United States and in the UK from right as early as the 1920s. The reason being that the Foreign Labor Department was in pristine archival collection, and so that was done to death, but nothing beyond that. And when I was doing my research, was looking at strike activity on the gold mines, I discovered that there were Chinese outside of the indentured Chinese, in other words, beyond the 65,000, and that led me to my PhD, but it wasn't plain sailing. Next slide, please. I went to go and do research in the Hong Kong Public Record Office after having gleaned the archives in London at Kew Gardens. And I was in the archives and a gentleman came up to me and was interested in what I was doing. And he said, you need to meet Professor Wong Gung Wu. And I'm like, me? No, don't think so. Um, I was young as many of you are. Um, you're probably not even born at the time, but he insisted. And the next thing I knew, I had an audience with none other than the Vice Chancellor of the University of Hong Kong. It was a turning point in my life. I'd never met somebody as gracious as this gentleman. And having come from Southern Africa, where when I started this research, it was questioned, what? You're doing what? Um, as a historian, nobody saw the value thereof. And it just that I just decided I'm doing this regardless. So I met Professor Wang Gungwu, and we had a wonderful conversation. And he said to me, I want to see you in November in California. And I'm like, Okay, <laughs> all right, you, you called the shots. And so the next thing I was packing off to California. So I'd literally been south of the world, north of the world, east of the world, and then I was going west. And then I met yet another human being has made an incredible impact on my life. None, none other than um, Ling Chi Wong. Next, please. And as you can see, the long, young Ling Chi Wong directed the Asian American <laughs> Berkeley. I was absolutely overwhelmed and met the most incredible people from across the world in this very hotel. Um, you can see there, I still have the program um, in my study. And this was the hotel, the Miyoko Hotel, um, before it changed to its current name. And if we go to the next slide, I think this is very prophetic. This was in my bedroom in this very hotel 30 years ago. And it says, it's still in my, my office at work. It still hangs on the wall. It's got a pride of place. And the little quote on the little, it's a little bookmark that was in the hotel room said, the firefly, as it dropped from the leaf, the way it flew. And I think that basically symbolized for me what happened with ISCO. It just flew and it's just grown from there. Um, so that, that's just sort of on a very sentimental note um, of where it all began for me. 
I received a phone call from Professor Ling Chi Wong, and I, I, I really was like astounded. He said to me, would you please uh, consider representing Africa? And I mean, here's this little young academic asking to represent Africa on ESCO. And I was delighted to take up the challenge. ESCO, as you know, has a Journal of Chinese Overseas. Um, and so I became involved in the process and was very honored and have been honored for the last 30 years. We had an ESCO conference in 2006. Next slide, please, thank you. Um, the Regional African Conference, where many of the colleagues sitting here joined us down in South Africa in Pretoria at, at the university where I was, and we had a conference there. And um, just for this is particularly for Wei, my daughter, who's now 21, was running around at that conference. Um, and then oh, we had a conference at the end of last year, also regional, looking at COVID-19 and Africa. So I've been part and parcel of all the conferences across the globe, as you can see. Um, and it's been an incredible experience, an incredible journey. And for all the young people here, this is not an ad break. This is instruction. You need to join ISCO um, going forward. I've had the privilege of doing um, many, many publications. One of the first was the Chinese Diaspora Selected Essays done under the editorship of Professor Wang Gungwu and Wang Lingqi, but many others from associations of different people from across the globe, whether it be Australia or Holland or, or Hong Kong. Um, it's led to incredible co collaborations and has enriched my research immensely. Um, go to the next slide, please, very briefly. Uh, the previous one, sorry. Um, also, with Yoon's permission, I have a picture of her up here. We met in 2007. We'd met before that, and Yoon had the idea of putting together an association. So we met down in, in downtown Johannesburg. There were about four or five of us who were interested in this, and Yoon then launched what has become an Africa-wide conglomeration with people across the world who are interested in China in Africa. And again, this has started off, as I say, with four or five people. And I'm very proud to say that Yoon has kept this flag flying, and we now have almost a 1,000 members um, in the China, Africa, Africa and China um, situation. And it's really doing quite amazing work and all kudos to, to Yoon for what she's done there. But then at another level, and I think this is also very important in this conference, is the fact that my little PhD focusing on the Chinese, which I had to fight to do, eventually became um, part of a court case in South Africa. As you know, South Africa was the hellhole of the world with, being, with apartheid and discrimination. But the new government brought in new legislation to even the playing fields. And so equity, in other words, um, employment equity was introduced. But under this dispensation, the Chinese were kept out. So under apartheid, Chinese people were regarded as non-white or black, if you like, under the colored grouping. And then under the new dispensation, the new government comes in and says they're non-black. So they lost both ways. And I was very fortunate to get um, an invitation from the Chinese Association of South Africa, which I've worked with for a very long time, two of the um, authors of a book on um, South African Chinese, one of the first book written by the community, Concessions um, and um, Color Confusion and Concessions, to be part of this, um, this court case. Um, and using my thesis and the judge, the sorry, the attorney for um, Pre President Nelson Mandela, George Bezos was took on the case and the Chinese after almost a decade won the case. Next slide, please. Here you can see the Dignity Day celebration, which was a celebration for eventually winning this and rectifying the, the misconception about the Chinese in South Africa. So there was a celebration um, held and it was held for a couple of years thereafter to celebrate not so much the win of being made black, the poster said Chinese are now black in terms of the Equity Act, but because of the dignity of the community of having their place restored in, in South African society. Next slide, please. Um, here again, we had another court case, which has only just been resolved a month ago. Yoon was also involved in this, where Chinese people um, received terrible um, accusations. One can almost, that's putting it mildly, there were terrible things put on Facebook about the Chinese in South Africa dealing with a case that was really taken out of proportion. And again, the Chinese uh, association stood firm and took um, people to government. The previous uh, court case, I might just add, took three ministerial departments to court. Um, and we beat them all and costs were paid. In this instance, I thought you'd like find it interesting to see that here ISCO played an indirect role right down at the bottom end of South Africa, because when I was put on 
um, and asked about it. They said, can you give us some details as to what this position in ISCO means or entails, especially how the experience you, you gain there shapes your understanding of the Chinese. And I was able to talk about the global, the comparative, the interconnectedness of the Chinese situation. And so that again um, led to a case being won. So ISCO has gone far beyond just the academic domains. It's also gone into the actual community at large. Last slide, please. And here you can see Irwin Pon when we won this last um, case. It is a very proud day for our Chinese community. Though it has taken five years for this outcome, it has been um, over 400 years since our forefathers experienced the indignities and hate of the past. During those days, we were told to keep our head down, take it on the chin, and not to cause any trouble. And now the lawyer, Joyce Nam Ford, said, we hope that today's judgment will not only send a message here in South Africa, but we expect it will echo across the world, highlighting the fact that hate and discrimination against Chinese, Asians, or any other community is not okay. It will not be accepted, and there will be consequences. And so, last slide, um, the Chinese have, as I say, achieved um, what they set out to do in South Africa, and I think stand as a beacon to the rest of the overseas Chinese community. On a last very personal note, I'm not one to actually bring these things to fore, but I thought I would, just before I left for uh, San Francisco from South Africa, I was invited to an award ceremony and I was given the Chances Award. And I do think that this award should be shared with my ISCO community and family, because without them, I would not have got to where I've got today. Last slide, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, next, I want to introduce uh, Professor Emmanuel Mamong. He is a geographer and director emeritus of the, I'm going to mangle the French, uh, Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique at the Université de Poitiers. Uh, his research focuses on social autonomy apprehended in its manifestations among migrant populations, um, among North Africans and Chinese. Um, from uh, to 1995 to 2004, he served as a director of Migrinter, a research unit of uh, the CNRS at the Université de Poitiers. Uh, he was also co-director and edited several issues at the Revue uh, Européenne de Migration. Okay, all right. Uh, and he's been the author of numerous articles and several books. Uh, his books include, and here I'm just summarizing, La Diaspora Chinoise Géographie d'une Migration and uh, Commerçant Maghrebine et Asiatique en France. Okay, I am going to stop torturing you with this, but <laughs> needless to say, he's, he's very accomplished and um, please come up and share your history. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, uh, I apologize. Uh, I bring in all my uh, interventions by this formula. I apologize for my very bad English. Uh, uh, and uh, I don't make uh, any progress in 30 years because <laughs> I did the same. Uh, it was, uh, uh, um, I said the same thing uh, 30 years ago. And in addition, uh, I don't hear now, I don't hear very well. So, uh, it's a great pleasure to be, to be here uh, and uh, to see again uh, the friend I have met around the world at the different conference that ISCO has organized over the 30 years uh, of its existence. I'm going to speak about the diversity uh, uh, of Chinese overseas. It's not an academic uh, paper, it's kind of conversation, a short conversation. Um, the, uh, and it's uh, the first uh, conference of ISCO uh, allow me uh, to, uh, to, to discover, in a way, the great diversity of the Chinese overseas. Uh, and I will start with a, an anecdote. Uh, that happened. I speak of this anecdote with, uh, with Ling Chi, I think, uh, yesterday. Uh, um, an anecdote that happened during the conference where the ISCO was created. In uh, this conference, the official language, uh, the, the, the official languages were English and Chinese. 
quite normal. And, but uh, because of the geographical proximity of California and Latin America, there were, was a strong presence of speakers from uh, Mexico, Panama, uh, Colombia, Peru, Argentina, Brazil, and I can't mention uh, them all. They presented, they presented papers on different aspects of the Chinese presence in this country, and most of them were of Chinese origin, like many people here. Uh, but almost of them were also Spanish speakers. And as is, as is common among Latin American scholars, they were very fluent in English. Uh, not like me. <laughs> so they could easily present their work in English. However, they asked at the very beginning of the conference that Spanish were, uh, uh, that Spanish be included as official language uh, along with uh, English and Chinese. The reason given was that the, the gringos, the it was the term they used, the gringos, you know what <laughs> that's me, uh, that the gringos uh, uh, did not have to impose their language. Uh, and these gringos were uh, almost of, of, of Chinese origin. So. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they treated it uh, half ironically, half seriously, to leave the conference if the gringos continued to impose el imperialismo yankee. <laughs> that was the term they used. Uh, I remember the scene uh, very well. Uh, uh, and maybe, uh, <laughs> I suppose, the link to you, you, you remember that. So, uh, uh, Spanish uh, was finally uh, uh, added uh, as official language of the conference. And I note that this conference, this one, uh, is, is also has the same three official languages. Uh, This anecdote is very, uh, is very important for me because uh, uh, it allowed me uh, to perceive the great diversity of Chinese overseas. It also, me, me, uh, me, it also made me aware of the diversity of Chinese overseas identification according to history, according to the countries, according to the condition of immigration. And uh, so, uh, as I said, this made me aware of the diversity of the identification, but also of uh, on the loyalty to the countries of origin, uh, and also the uh, loyalties uh, to the country of settlement. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, um, sorry. <laughs> Uh, 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 this made me uh, uh, aware of also of, of hybridiz hybridization, creolization at work in Chinese that diaspora. In this regard, I can also tell you about uh, uh, the ESCO conference uh, in Cuba in 1999. It was a real event because uh, it was uh, very unusual that. Uh, uh, for academics from the United States to, to come for a conference in Cuba. And there are many things to say about that. And in Cuba, we find another form of identification, of uh, another form of loyalty, allegiance, and so on. Uh, uh, and as you know, the presence in, uh, uh, in, uh, of Chinese uh, overseas in Cuba was very important since up to one third of the population was Chinese at the end uh, of the 19th century. Most of them were coolies uh, who worked in the sugarcane plantation, things, side by side with slaves, since slavery was not abolished in Cuba until uh, 1896. And as you know, uh, Cuba is an assembly of very uh, uh, diverse population, and the great, the great uh, Cuban writer uh, Alejo Carpentier 
uh, said that, uh, that uh, a true Cuban was uh, one third Spanish, one third African, and one third Chinese. Well, this uh, this uh, 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 this this uh, image is very known. No? This, is it, this is the the gateway in Barrio Chino, and it it illustrates the presence of Chinese in Cuba. I discover uh, on this occasion that the Chinese the Chinese took an important part in the Cuban War of Independence. And there are commemorative plaques and a mon monument to the glory of Chinese fighters who died for uh, independence of Cuba. As, uh, uh, este monument, monument is erected to the memory of the Chinos who combated for the independence of Cuba. I think. It was erected in 1931. So, of course, it's a, a sign, important sign uh, uh, of uh, 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 strong loyalty to, to, to an allegiance to, uh, to, the, to the Cuban society. Uh, more recently, uh, I, less, I, I learned a less, very, uh, less dramatic uh, 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 um, things. Uh, the Jamaican, uh, the Chinese Jamaican, that uh, wait, the Chinese Jamaican played a leading role in the invention and dissemination of reggae. I didn't know that before in the uh, 1960s. And there have been, been uh, and still are a number of reggae bands with Chinese Jamaican in them. You can find a lot of uh, Jamaican, Chinese Jamaican reggae artists. And uh, you can find a lot of things uh, uh, on the internet. Um, uh, so it's another uh, 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 illustration of, uh, uh, of kind of uh, identification or other form of identification. But when I learned this, uh, I was not in the Caribbean at all. I was in Tahiti to participate in, in a symposium organized by uh, our colleague, Professor Leopold Moussiyan. And he is the one of, who introduced me to the role of Chinese Jamaican in reggae. You know, in Tahiti, I, 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 so it was the first time I, I hear about that. And Leopold is a descendant of long established Polynesian Chinese. And as you know, many of them came in the second half of the 19th century as Kuli also to work in sugarcane uh, fields in, uh, in uh, Polynesia. And uh, the conference uh, was on Chinese diasporas and Eden indigenous identity. I was able to observe during this conference uh, another form of, of hybridization of Chinese overseas, uh, and I made uh, another form of creolization, and I, I met Chinese Maori from uh, Hawaii and uh, New Zealand. And uh, let me say a few words about this conference. There is a great of, uh, a variety of identity construction that work in the relation of Chinese overseas with the po population of the Maori area, which is a very large Mar uh, area, uh, including Polynesia, Hawaii, and New Zealand. And uh, this identity construction these identification are all different from the idea of an irreductible and inalienable Chinese identity. On the contrary, they join the new uh, uh, problematization of uh, uh, identity issue. It's not, uh, it's, it is not a question of thinking in terms of integration, assimilation, differentialism, pluralism, or multiculturalism, but rather in terms of indigenization 
crossbreeding, hybridization, or and cultural localization. In my opinion, these notions, which have multiplied in recent decades, deserve to be put into perspective with the notion of creolization in the sense that Edouard Glissant gives it. Edouard Glissant is a uh, an important French language, uh, French uh, language writer from uh, Martinique, in the West Indies, uh, in the West Indies. According to him, creolization is not specific to the West Indies and can be applied to other societies, and uh, including, I believe, Polynesia and uh, many other parts. This is the reason why it appears on the. Uh, 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 in, the, uh, in the book that was drawn from uh, this conference. Yes, it means Chinese diasporas and creolization. Um, and uh, the cover of, the, of this book show a different generation of Chinese, uh, 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 Chinese uh, Polynesian. And you can see that uh, uh, Creolization. Uh, well, I, I will stop now because uh, 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 I can tell you other story. Okay, I finish. <laughs> uh, uh, I can tell you other stories of creolization, but uh, uh, it's what it, simply uh, by simply listing. A, Countless example of colonization, hybridization, in designation of uh, Chinese overseas. So, uh, probably we find it in South Africa, uh, in, uh, in Philippines, and uh, in, in the United States. <laughs> that is what I want to to tell you on the importance for me of the first uh, conference uh, thirty years ago. Thank you very much. Uh, and so we have uh, Ling Chi Wong, who is, we all know by now, has been so instrumental in bringing together this organization and just really providing incredible leadership over the decades. Uh, he is Professor Emeritus of Ethnic Studies at UC Berkeley, where he helped establish the Asian American Studies program and taught its first course in 1969. He is a founder of the Chinese for Affirmative Action and has received the Association for Asian American Studies Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, he headed up the Asian American Studies program and the department several times before he retired in 2006. Um, he has also uh, been, you know, a scholar and an advocate. He has been been at the forefront of language education rights advocacy for more than four decades, um, advocating for uh, language immersion programs, inclusion of Asian languages by the Educational Testing Services, and most recently, the building of a San Francisco Community College branch in San Francisco Chinatown, um, where Chinatown restaurant and garment workers might take ESL classes in and near the communities where they live and work. So here's Ling Chi Wong. You notice I'm not carrying anything because I am strictly a uh, technological illiterate <laughs> and also um, low tech, strictly low tech. But uh, since we have limited time, so I will only just make a few few remarks about uh, you know what happened in the past thirty years. Um, but let me begin by saying that. Uh, you know, a gathering of this type, where you have scholars from both sides of the, uh, the former you know, Iron Curtain, and scholars from both sides of the Taiwan Strait, mainland in China, could not have happened before 1992. It was against the law, in fact, for scholars to meet together to share their scholarship. and. Uh, and what made it possible, of course, was the end of the Cold War in 1990, and uh, also the 1992 consensus, a political consensus between 
mainland and Taiwan at a very historic meeting in Singapore in 1992, opening the doors for scholars from both sides of the East-West divide and both sides of the Taiwan Strait to be able to come together openly and legally and to share their, uh, their scholarships. So that's, that's what made the 1992 conference very historic in that sense. We have uh, 21 scholars from mainland China and about 12 from Taiwan. And we actually have government officials from both sides at this hotel to welcome all the delegates, not only in two separate cocktail receptions, but also have dinner in this very same room. Um, our chancellor was sitting right there, and then the two council general, one from Taiwan and one from PRC, sitting next to him. I mean, that's just so amazing. And, uh, and that's what really, I think in many ways, was what ISCO is all about, bringing people together from all parts of the world and to share their, their knowledge and share their aspirations uh, with each other. And that's what makes it so you know, exciting about the 1992 conference. Now, there are other things, you know, Karen has put on here the cover of the uh, program and also the poster of the 1992. And you notice that the theme of the conference was called Luo Di Sengen, meaning meaning that you transplant your roots from your homeland to a foreign land and then allowing the roots to take root in the, in the foreign land. And that is, a, you know, to me, is a very important paradigm shift from pre-1992 approach to the study of Chinese overseas. Pre-1992's approach, and you take a look at the, the many books and articles published in both, in, all in Chinese, you know, in both Taiwan and in the mainland China, it's all about ruo ye gui gen. When, when the leaves fall from the trees, the leaves return to the roots, meaning that when you get old and retire overseas, you return to your homeland villages where you came from. That was predominantly the, uh, the orientation of uh, overseas Chinese, essentially mostly, well, as, especially before 19 World, World War, uh, between, be, before World War II, but during the World War II, you know, this, con you know, sort of cut off. China was uh, occupied by Japan, cut off. So a lot of Chinese overseas will have to start thinking about planting their roots wherever they were. And that was, and so 1992 essentially affirmed the idea of ruo di sengkern, you plant your roots on foreign lands, wherever you settle down. And that's a very, for the Chinese, you know, immigrants, that's a very, you know, for thousands of years, Chinese have been moving around the world, but they always returned. But World War II and the Cold War, Cold War reinforced that idea. And so you can, you can see visibly the Chinese overseas began to plant their roots on foreign soil. And I think that's a very positive de development. And uh, that's what I wanted to use the 1992 conference to reaffirm this whole idea that Chinese are not just birds of passage or something that, uh, you know, sojourners, but you know, I mean, a notion that is in, imposed actually by the, on the Chinese by all these, uh, you know, countries all around the world. And they, they see Chinese, oh, you're here just to make money and then to take home, you know, and return to your villages. Not anymore since the Second World War reinforced in the, in the, in the, uh, cold, during the Cold War. So that's, that's, that's very important. Another very important thing that happened, and that is 
that the uh, if you look, take a look at the literature, most of the books, most of the studies done on overseas Chinese were all pretty much written in Chinese. A few that's written in French, in Spanish, and uh, in, of course, uh, many of them in English, were mostly written from the perspective of colonizer in these various countries. And, and so, and their main concern, of course, is, well, the Chinese are not, you know, are they going to cause problems or not? And then during the Cold War, it's further into uh, reinforce the question that are asked repeatedly, especially in Southeast Asia. Is it safe for the national security to have Chinese in our midst? A kind of question that is debated in this country now, hardly debated. Uh, we, can we trust the Chinese Americans who are here? It's, it's really very alarming now that, that what is going on now. But during the Cold War, that was the, one of the two major questions asked by scholars doing research on Chinese diaspora. First, you know, are they a threat to the national security? which is a question that you know, Biden has been asking. And are they assimilable? Can the Chinese be assimilated into the mainstream society or not? So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a perspective that clearly ignore the perspective, aspiration, and experience of Chinese diaspora in all these different countries. And so, OK, I need to, to conclude here. Okay, so, and then I look at the scholarship, books published in Chinese uh, in Taiwan and mainland China. Um, they don't quote anything from outside of the Chinese world. So the, the Western scholars may be doing study about whether they are security threat or not, or assimilable or not, but the Chinese scholars are looking at, hey, are these Chinese loyal and trustworthy who are living in our midst or not? And, and whether they have given, well, or, or, no, their main concern really was, you know, a, a, a sorry, I'm just losing my, my, my thought and I'm gonna try to conclude it. Oh, the question is, are they loyal to their homeland country or not? culturally, economically, and politically. And that's, that's all they're concerned about. That's why there's so much scholarship going on during the, the Cold War era on both sides of the Taiwan Strait. And they don't, you know, and they don't really quote from each other, and they don't quote from uh, you know, scholars outside of, of, uh, of the Chinese world. So I think you know, East Coast establishment of uh, you know, 30 years ago, have made a profound influence in the way we look at Chinese diaspora. And, and very importantly, because I come from an ethnic studies background, so you know, the Chinese in the diaspora, what their perspectives, their sentiment, their feelings, their aspiration, their experience, all of which it's now become the center of our approach to the study of Chinese diaspora, rather than from an outsider, you know, looking in. But of course, you know, we need outsider's perspective as well. As well. But I think it's very important for the first time, I think since 1992, that we have a new focus on how we approach the Chinese diaspora. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Ling Chi. And we are formally at time.